thanks to all of you who are joining remote and of course thanks for joining live from munich unfortunately i couldn't be there today but i hope this works too okay since we have a little delay between you and me i will answer all of your questions at the end of the talk in a short q a section um, please if you have questions put them in the chat in the questions tab and for the people live in munich i think there will be a microphone provided for you all right let's get started then hi i'm hauke so uh, sorry for the rather historical photo there it's really from the pre-corona era where i still wore suits now i'm happy if i still wear pants um Anyway, I'm a senior software engineer at a startup called DeepUp, and I build software, mostly microservices, which then run in Kubernetes, and I do that mostly with Kotlin. Well, uh, you guessed it probably from the talk title, right? But I also use Python because of uh, machine learning. Yeah, and I'm rather passionate about machine learning, and that's really why I'm working on bringing the best of software engineering into the world of machine learning. So. I had to promise my colleagues that I would definitely tell you briefly about what our company does. So DeepUp is a deep tech startup with a headquarters in Bonn, but we are pretty spread out and remote. And I'm sitting here right in the middle of the forest near Hanover. We are about 60 people on the team and we want to grow further. And our goal is the completely automated measurement of newly laid underground cables, pipes, and data lines. And we have developed a device that can measure entire excavation and uh, trenches in 3D with centimeter precision. And this data is processed in the cloud using machine learning and then made available to communication companies, civil engineers, and network operators um, as, as documentation, as 3D models, and as line plans. And this means that our customers always have an overview of the construction progress. And we prevent the next excavator from pulling the fresh data uh, pipeline right back out of the ground. And we can do that faster, easier, and more precisely than with all previous methods. All right, so enough of the advertising. Let's get started. Today, we are going to talk about Kotlin for machine learning. But before we talk about Kotlin for machine learning, we need to briefly talk about machine learning, specifically machine learning in a business context. What do we want to achieve with machine learning? Well. We want to feed a model with some data so the model can make certain predictions about the world. So far, so good. But there's one thing about doing machine learning in a business context that makes it different from doing machine learning in research. And that is models are useless. S to risk, double S to risk, footnote. Now, of course, that's a pretty blatant statement to begin with, right? Especially at an ML conference. So let me tone that down a little bit. About 90% of ML models don't make it into production. But then again, to be more blunt, this means that about 90% of machine learning projects are useless for our business. A model is only useful if it's been made available to users. Otherwise, it's just not useful. But how do we make a model available? Well, by putting it into production, right? So what we actually want are not just ML models, but machine learning systems. So not just a single artifact, but a whole set of components that allow us to experiment, to collaborate, and to continuously build new versions of our models. And above all, to lift these models into a productive environment and to run them there and to monitor them. And an ML system is much more than just a model. We have many, many moving parts that all have to work together. At the core, of course, is the model itself. But in order for us to deliver it, we have to embed it in some form of web service or app. And we can then get data from our users, our business systems, and deliver predictions. When we run a model in, product, in production, we also have to monitor it. So classic software just runs as well after months as it did on day one. Of course, there will be bugs, but the basic behavioral characteristics of the production software do not change. But with machine learning models, that's really different. Because these equality decreases over time. And a model that works in a production environment and is not retrained will degrade over time it will never achieve as good a performance as it did on day one. Most of the time, we will not train one model that can be used forever, right? Because quality decreases over time. Therefore, we have to train new models continuously. And especially when I develop large or deep, deep learning models, I will not develop them on my laptop because, yeah, it's just not possible, right? I will do that in a cloud environment or on an on 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 on-premise GPU cluster. And for that, I need a continuous training pipeline. 
And for training my machine learning model, I need data. I get these data for my production systems, but most of the time I cannot throw them into my training environment in, in its raw state, right? The data must first be prepared and filtered and labeled. And for this, I need a data pipeline or ETL pipeline. And if I work in a larger teams or across multiple teams, it really makes sense to make the data available to other teams. And I can use a feature store for that. So now I can train my new models continuously and with fresh data, and I can bring new models into production. But these models have to be recorded in versions somehow. Otherwise, I can't simply switch back and forth between model versions. For example, imagine if my new model just gives uh, give us bad results, right? And I only catch that in production. Um, I don't want to wait until my previous version of my model has been trained again. So I want to version models. And depending on the size, I can do this in a version control system like Git or DVC, or I can provide a central model registry for that. And the development of machine learning models always involves experimentation. So I would like to get an overview of what experiments I have already done and what the results were, because I want to reproduce the experiments and reuse the results in the future. What I need is a tool to track and manage, manage experience. And this prevents my data scientists from duplicating or triplicating experiments or losing results. Okay, Whew. yeah, that's, that's quite a lot of tools now. Of course, I won't need them all right away from the start. When I start with my first views, that's obvious, right? But when we talk about Kotlin for machine learning, we have to remember that in the end, it's not just about putting together a deep learning model with, with TensorFlow Lego bricks, right? It's about how I build reliable, reproducible, and scalable machine learning systems and how I run them. And for that, I just need a certain set of tools. Today, I want to give you a little overview and show you what is currently possible with Kotlin in this respect. Namely, I want to take a look at the three big blocks from the ML lifecycle and show you what you can do with Kotlin for each of them. I will start with an example from data pipelines and experiments, and I show you how Kotlin can be used in Jupyter Notebooks. Then I continue with model development in Kotlin DL, and in the end, I will show you how you can build a simple model server with Ktor. But before I talk a lot about what you can do actually with Kotlin, I want to briefly pick up those of you who might be wondering what is this, this Kotlin stuff. I just came here to the talk to, to relax a little and drink a coffee, right? So to pick those of you up, what is Kotlin? So Kotlin is a strongly typed and more importantly, statically typed programming language. So it was initially developed with the goal of being a better alternative to Java, which is good probably. Kotlin is interoperable with Java, so you can use Kotlin and Java at the same time in one application. And this is really very handy if you want to convert old Java applications to Kotlin, which happens quite a lot, right? Like Java Kotlin runs on the JVM and compiles to JVM bytecode. Kotlin is mainly developed by JetBrains and the first stable release of it was in 2016 already. Fun fact, Kotlin has this nice little mascot uh, since October 2021, but the little guy still doesn't have a name yet, so I call it Kotlin make Kotlin face. Back to Kotlin itself, Kotlin is compatible with Java on a JVM bytecode level, which is good. But Kotlin has a syntax that is not compatible with Java, which is really good. In fact, many things can be expressed much so shorter and much more elegantly than in Java. Kotlin, as I said, can be compiled to JVM bytecode, but not only to JVM bytecode, but also to native code for mobile and desktop systems and to JavaScript if you really want to do that, but it's possible. I define a function in Kotlin with fun. Fun main is really just more elegant than public static void main string args, right? Uh, as you do in Java. And I declare a variable with var or with val if I want it to be immutable. And when I assign a value to a variable, the type is automatically inferred by Kotlin. Or I can add a colon and explicitly specify a type. So Kotlin is able to infer types, but the type of each variable is set at compile time. The wrong use of null pointers is really a pain, right? Because it causes null pointer exceptions to fly up in my face left and right. Kotlin has built-in null safety. So it's already uh, checked at compile time if a variable is allowed to become null at all. I then have to specify if a variable is nullable or not when I declare that variable. 
if I use a variable that is nullable without first checking whether it is null, then I get a compile time error. I can check for this with the question mark, uh, which are uh, just the null test operators. And I can use an alternative value instead then if the variable is null with this Elvis operator, so question mark colon. And then I can provide basically a default value. Kotlin supports normal object-oriented programming, um, which yeah, is quite handy if you want to replace Java, right? I can define classes and attributes and methods, and of course, I can use the whole bag of tricks of object-oriented programming that I know from Java. So, so interfaces and inheritance and uh, abstractions and all, all the stuff like this. But I can also do special functional things that don't work in Java. For example, I can use extension functions to extend the functionality of classes without having to create a new class first. I already said that Kotlin is much more compact than Java. In Kotlin, there's just much less boiler code that I, that I don't have to write. Take this example class in Java, I have to write getters and setters and really consume my annual supply of semicolons, right? It's all, all really clunky. As an alternative to all those boring stuff, Kotlin offers data classes. So this saves me many, many lines of code for the really exact same functionality here. And I think this is really elegant. And if I want to get my data back out of this class, Kotlin also supports destructuring. And this makes my code much short, uh, uh, shorter and still readable. A killer feature, or actually the killer feature of Kotlin, is coroutines. Coroutines are a simple and very efficient way to write asynchronous non-blocking code. This allows me to execute concurrent code for, for code that just takes longer to run, such as calling a slow API, for example. And I can do that without blocking my main thread. And I also don't need to create a million single threads for this, which would be really a big overhead. OK, so that was a quick overview and a quick intro to Kotlin. As promised, I would like to show you now some examples of how we can use Kotlin in the different parts of our ML lifecycle. So when we start a new ML project, we always start with data analysis and first experiments. And those almost always take place in Jupyter notebooks, right? I think most of you already know Jupyter notebooks. And it's used right because it's really just a very convenient way to have data and notes and code and visualizations all in the same place. So it, it would be good if we could also work with Kotlin Jupyter notebooks, right? Okay, so uh, I have a small demo for that. And yeah, now <laughs> welcome to, to a Jupyter notebook. As I said, probably uh, many of you already know this. So um, as you see, I can do uh, the really interesting stuff like uh, print line with, um, with, uh, with Kotlin in my Jupyter notebook. But I can also, of course, uh, do, do different stuff. Otherwise, it would be just really boring, right? So I, here I create a data class, um, uh, a book, and I assign a value to the data class, and then I can print out this data class again. And as you can see right here in my in my um, Jupyter notebook, I can run Kotlin code. You uh, can also see, okay, here's a Kotlin kernel running. Normally, it would be just a Python kernel, but uh, but here it's it's a Kotlin kernel. So I can do all kinds of fun stuff. I can use Kotlin function with uh, default arguments. Uh, I can use I can use mappers for arrays, um, and of course um, I can't only use Kotlin, but I can also use interoperable Java libraries. For example, if I want to to print an image, I can just import Java X image IO, um, which is a yeah, a basic class for, for using images, right? I can just import that and then read an image from, um, from a URL and, and print that out. Okay, but if I, if I do it with print line here, that well, I get this nice um, yeah, object to string. So that is um, yeah, really nice for debugging, but uh, not, not very intuitive, right? And for that, if I really want to see the image, I can use the built-in uh, display function here. And then I can just print out the image IO ob object and uh, see the image. So that is all the built-in stuff. But what if I want to use dependencies? For example, imagine if I have a really, really strange and exotic data format, right? So XML, for example. 
right here i have a big xml blob and pff, uh, now i do i really need to go ahead and write my own xml parser for that uh, i i don't really want that to be honest so what can i do hmm. there are already existing xml parsers for example jackson is there that is yeah, really in, in the java world and the kotlin world and the xml parser, right um and to to import that in my jupyter notebook i use the add file depends on syntax and then i can import these libraries and I can uh, use them just like any built-in library. So I import them, then I create an XML wrapper, uh, mapper, and register Kotlin module so that um, yeah, I really can use it. And then I create another data, uh, data class and uh, pass my XML value in uh, from the XML input. And then I get um, nice, nice data class, a list of users. And I can print them out and I can do all the fun stuff with it I can normally do, like only extracting the list of names from the list of users. And you can see that all works really well. So one of the main use cases um, you want to do in, in Jupyter is probably exploring data sets, right? So I I'll, uh, will now load the most used data set for demos like this, right? The Titanic data set with the passenger data from Titanic. and um, to display that, I use data frame and Krangle. Um, I read a uh, CSV file, a Titanic CSV, and uh, load it into my data frame. And takes a moment, and then um, yeah, the first 20 lines of this data frame are printed out and tells me, OK, that are only the top 20 of 950 rows. OK, um, CSV, that is just text, right? And um, But I said, OK, Kotlin is statically and strongly typed. So what, what happens under the covers? Um, if we take a look, data frame um, passes all the stuff that it finds in, in my raw data file to, to data types. So passenger ID uh, seems to be an int, survive is an int because it's zero or one, and it's a nullable int. You can see the, the question mark here. So that means for some passengers, we just don't know if they survive. Well, well they're probably dead by now, but uh, yeah, in that moment, we don't know if they survived. Also for some passengers, we don't know if they even were on board. So and now from the data frame, I can extract um, some data, uh, some columns like, like the name of the passenger, or I can with select extract multiple columns like name and age here. Also I can, can do filters like filter for, for names, uh, every name that contains Jones, uh, that is just um, surprisingly just one passenger, Mr. Charles Crescent Jones. Um, okay, and now I can I can filter also on, on other stuff like uh, age ranges. Oh, but what is that? Uh, I, I get an error here, and the uh, error says, okay, um, I'm I'm not uh, allowed to compare against the nullable receiver. So what does it mean? Um, as I said, strongly typed, right? And um, null save. And if we look at age, we see it's a it's a nullable double. So. For some passenger, we just don't know the age, so uh, the uh, some some values are probably null in that column. So now I I need to check. Okay, mm, first I want to filter out all of the passengers where we don't know um, the age. So I just say filter. Okay, age unequals null, so not null. Um, and then age should be over fifty, and then we count, and then we see okay, sixty eight passengers. Uh, are over 50. And also I can um, not just import data frames, but create them on my own. So create a little data frame here, and then I can use all the stuff that you know from SQL, so uh, relational stuff. So like in a join, I join my original data frame with my newly created data frame. And um, like this, I can extract some, some, um, some passengers based on their uh, ticket numbers. Okay, so this is how I can work with raw data and explore some data, but uh, in, in tabular form, it's really kind of unintuitive. So I want to plot some stuff. And for that, I use let's plot. Um, so I uh, use the, the magic use function here and to, to import it. And then I just create some, some data uh, that I can visualize. And then uh, I, I get started with let's plot. First, I define a data layer in let's plot. So um, yeah, x is uh, x and y is y, okay? Um, because I just named my my map here like x and y, and then I put a visualization layer 
uh, on the plot data. So uh, a geometric point layer with the size five, so points will be plotted with si uh, size five. I, I put it in there and you can see it's all nicely plotted here. I can also add additional layers. So uh, together with the geometric point layer, I can uh, add a geometric smooth layer here. And um, yeah, well, then I get some, some smooth line between uh, through all of these points. Um, and that is yeah, just a few examples of what I can do with Let's Plot. I can also uh, split by category, define colors, and also I not only can, uh, can plot points, but of course I also can plot density plots and all the stuff like this, right? So yeah, that is really just a, just a sh short overview what you can do with Kotlin in Jupyter Notebooks. And as a little recap, I used Krangle and data frames to load, to edit, and to explore the data. And by the way, you don't have to try to write down all these links. There will be one link at the end where you can find all the tools, right? OK, uh, back, back to the recap. To plot the nice graphics, I used Let's Plot. And all these libraries you can use in your normal Kotlin code as well, right? Not just only in Jupyter. But if you want to use Kotlin in Jupyter, you need the Kotlin Jupyter kernel and, of course, Jupyter, right? Otherwise, it's really difficult to run Kotlin in Jupyter. OK. The second small demo I would like to show you is building models. So the creation of model architectures and the training of models. And for this, I use Kotlin DL. Kotlin DL is a high-level deep learning API. So it's written in Kotlin. And it's heavily inspired by Keras. So yeah, high level API, right? Under the hood, it uses TensorFlow Java API and the ONNX runtime API for Java. Kotlin DL provides really simple APIs for training deep learning models from scratch, for importing existing Keras and ONNX models for inference, and for using transfer learning to adapt existing pre-trained models for your tasks. A little disclaimer, what I'm going to show you is of course just a small toy example, right? Real model training takes a little bit more resources than my laptop can provide and a little bit more time than we have in this slot. But but anyway, um, it's yeah just, just a little toy example, but it's I think it's kind of interesting. So with that out of the way, let's get started. So I changed the, the tab in my Jupyter Notebook because, well, I already have a Jupyter Notebook open, so why not? Um, oh, uh, and the title is... Uh, still left in German, please ignore that. Um, I, I have already my Jupyter Notebook open, and I said here, OK, use Kotlin DL. And for, for training data, I already preloaded the Fashion Ems data set, so uh, provided by uh, Zalando. Thank you very much for that. It's um, yeah, really a nice data set with um, 10 categories of, of clothing, so um, yeah, some pants, some, some shirts, some shoes, and all this fun stuff. Um, and we try to train a classifier on that. It's a, as I said, the toy example, it's a really easy task, um, but um, just for, for showing what you can do actually with Kotlin DL. So first of all, I need to decide on a model architecture. So what should my lo model look like, right? And for that, I define a sequential model. So every layer is, um, yeah, went to uh, in sequence, right? And first I define an input layer and that is uh, 28 by 28 pixels. I uh, flatten um, this grid of pixels into one vector. And then I just define three the, um, fully connected layers, so dense layers with uh, 300 neurons, 110 output neurons, because I have, of course, 10 categories that I want to um, differentiate between. OK, so now uh, I have built the model architecture. And then I compile, uh, compile this. And uh, for uh, that I don't have to write net.compile and stuff like this all the time, I use the scoping function, this with. Um, so inside of, of this brackets here, um, this refers to, to net, to my model architecture. So then I can compile it. Um, I, I just chose uh, Adam Optimizer because why not? And uh, for loss, because I have no better idea what to choose, I just choose softmax cross entropy. 
this logic. And as metric, I choose accuracy. So, and after that, I will print out um, well what I actually compiled. So what does the architecture of my model look like? How many neurons do I have? Stuff like this. And then I start the training. Um, I start the training with fit and the fit function is well call, um, called on the this context, so on the net. And so I fit the net to this training data set and I do just five epochs uh, because I hope that is something my laptop can actually do, batch size is 100. And then at the end, I want to evaluate it. So uh, with the test data set and a batch size of 100 again, I evaluate the model um, and get the accuracy metric printed out. And then I save my uh, fancy created net in a file named my fancy model. And I choose to overwrite just maybe because I have tested that before um, that we don't get an error if this net already exists. Okay. Um, I will run this and oh. that was really fast. So um, here we get the printout or the model summary. So as you can see, I, I did not lie to you. It's really, um, yeah, uh, the, the input shape is here. It's 28 by 28 uh, pixels and it's flattened into a big vector, then processed to uh, three dense layers. And um, you can see the total number of trainable parameters. Um, just about 270,000 parameters, no frozen parameters. So every parameter can be trained. Um, frozen parameters you would get if you would do um, some, some retraining, right? Or if you um, say, okay, the last, I don't know, uh, three layers of my 50 um, layer model, I want you um, to retrain and everything else should be uh, should be the same. So I freeze some, some amount of layers and only the other stuff gets retrained. And at the end, you can see, um, well, with just like a few lines of code, we already get a accuracy of um, 87%. As I said, it's it's really a toy example. But as you can see here, um, you really can train and um, build model architectures quite easily with Kotlin DL. And um, I think it's yeah, it's a really nice and elegant way to to do your experiments, even as you can see in in Jupyter Notebooks with Kotlin DL. Okay, that was building models with Kotlin DL. So Kotlin DL is currently at version 0 0.4.0, so still far away from 1.0, but I think it's, it's really exciting and there's great progress being made, right? The biggest limitation from my point of view right now is that PyTorch is not supported, only TensorFlow. But actually, that's already on the roadmap of the project. And really, the project is very, very open for participation from motivated Kotlin developers, so like you folk, for example. OK, and now let's move on to the third demo. So the following situation, we have finally a trained model, and we want to make that available in a web service. So we need a model server. And I want to build that with Ktor. Ktor is a Kotlin native framework to build web applications and APIs. So it's something like, like Spring or Quarkus, or in the in the Python world, it would be like, like Flask, right? Or nah, not, not really like Django, more like Fast API. So the base for Ktor are Kotlin coroutines. And that means that Ktor works completely asynchronously without me having to do anything for that. OK, so. Quick demo for that. So you should see my IDE. And as you already can see, uh, 56 lines is uh, the whole demo. I will build the, the model server in, in these few lines of code. So uh, fun main. So the model server really runs from my main function here. And to have something to serve, I, I need a model for that. I, I could just take the model from, from the previous demo, but uh, well, that's not, not so fun. So I, I choose another model. Uh, I just um, choose a pre-trained model, load that from the ONNX model hub. Um, and I choose here an object detection model SSD, take a pre-trained model and save that as model file. In the real world, I would do that differently, of course. Um, probably I would... Um, I would bake the model into the Docker image that I would create with my model server. So everything is packaged neatly in one, one uh, Docker file and one Docker image. 
and I would put the model right in, in there and then load it just from, from a file. Okay, to start the server, I first create create a server, a Kator server, right? And I, for that, I say, okay, I want an embedded server. I choose Netty for that. Should run on port 80, uh, 89 and host as well localhost, right? Mm. And then I that is all I, I need to do to create a server. And then I can just start the server with start. So when I run the main function, the server is started and then runs indefinitely. Now I need to configure it because otherwise it would be just an empty server that is just spending CPU cycles and not doing anything. First of all, I uh, install a, a little plugin, uh, so content negotiation Jackson. So that is just that I don't need to convert my outputs manually to Jackson because it, pff, who, who wants to do that, right? I, I, I don't want to go ahead and for every object create manually a JSON output that is yeah, just, just no fun. So installing content negotiation Jackson, then automatically um, my outputs are converted um, to JSON if I don't specify otherwise. Then I need a route, right? So for calling the for calling the server, I need a route. And uh, first of all, I define a get route here. And uh, just at, at the root level, I define a route. And um, for that, I just want to respond with a text. Who would have thought that? Hello world, content type, I specify explicitly here. Content type is text HTML. And um, I already run the server in the background. So I can show you how that look. Um, in, in my REST client, I just call the, uh, the root URL. And way, hello world, we see a nice blank HTML page with just hello world in the most ugliest of fonts written here. OK, so that seems to work. But that is not model serving. That is serving one static page of HTML, right? So yeah, that is not what we wanted. So what we want to do is um, we want to send data to our model server. So that our model has something to work on, right? And for that, we need a post endpoint. I define that with post. Um, and since we just have these two endpoints, I just call that detect. OK, and inside here, first we need to do borrowing stuff again before we can do actual model serving. We need to um, take the request and pull the data out of it. So um, I will send my, my, my image that I will send there. I will send that as form data. So uh, from the call, I extract the multipart form data, um, create a new file name, so just random UUID, so I can save my files for, for later with, uh, with an ID. And then for the multipart data, you can have multiple, well, since it's basically a form, you can have multiple entries, so to say, in the form. So I need to work through every part of my multipart data. And for each, uh, for each type, I say then, OK, if that is a file item, so if I really send a file there, then I do uh, stuff with it. For everything else, well, I define that as to do. So if I really motivated later, I can uh, finish that and for um, define something to do with every part of multipart data. OK, so then if we get a file, we first get the original file name from the file, and then we get really the files, um, yeah. Uh, the, the bytes, sorry, the bytes out of, of the file, so what we actually want. Then we uh, do a little logging here and um, save the received file as new file writes bytes in it, and um, now we have a file on the server. So that was the Boeing part, and now comes the real um, inference part. So we have a model, we put some data in there and get a result. How does that look? Well, um, to, to have that, I... Um, use Kotlin DL again, so the inference part of Kotlin DL. And for that, I say, OK, I have my model. I have already loaded that from the ONX model hub. And for that, I then just need to um, need to call detect objects on this model. Because from the ONX model hub, I know, OK, that is an object detection model. And I can just input a file here. And I say, OK, give me the top three results. And then I have detected objects. I log these. And then I respond, and um, to the to the Jackson uh, plugin I installed, it's automatically converted to JSON. And the real model inference part is really well in two lines, let's say, um, plus a little bit of logging. 
So, and this is how I can create a model server in just 56 lines of Kotlin code with Kotlin DL and Ktor. And to see that it actually works, I have um, prepared a nice picture of a cat, my cat, uh, sitting in the forest here. And I will send that to our model server to the base URL detect. You see, I, it, as I said, it's multi-part form data and we have a field here called image and we upload the cat here. And let's see, that takes a while. And we get the top three results and the object detection uh, network things well. Hmm. Probably that's a dog. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, it's but it's only about 37% um, sure. So not pretty sure. Cat comes at uh, a second place and bird at third place. Okay, maybe I, I shouldn't show these results to my cat because uh, he will be really angry about this probably. But as you can see, it's uh, it's quite easy to 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 build a model server like this. Okay, that was the third demo. And that was really just a really, really simple example of model serving with Kato, right? But Kato is really a great framework for building APIs quickly. So the best comparison is really perhaps fast API and Python. By the way, speaking of Python, why, why should we even bother with uh, Kotlin when it comes to machine learning? If you look at the topic of machine learning, there's one programming language that is absolutely dominant, right? And that is Python. So right off the bat, why should we even look at other programming languages? Or the other way around, why is Python so popular for machine learning? Yeah, really, Python is a great programming language, right? It has a very mature ecosystem of libraries for data processing, for machine learning, from vector mass, matrix mass, and Python is a really great scripting language. So when we look at Python code, the code almost looks like pseudocode, but it actually works. And that is really great because what we must not forget, most data scientists are not software engineers. The job of a data scientist is not about learning some low level nitty gritty programming language to write some super performance optimized code, especially when it comes to just building a small script or to analyze data. A data scientist needs to have deep knowledge in statistics and algorithm development. And for this Python is just ideal. It's easy to use and can be used to access high performance libraries written in C, so NumPy or TensorFlow, for example. So why should we bother with Kotlin? Well, deployment to production is not the end of a machine learning project. I already said that. In fact, it's just another phase in the project. After all, we are not done when we have deployed our model into production. We spend most of our time on maintenance and on extending components. And the more code we create, the more confusing the whole thing becomes, right? What can help us when projects get bigger is a strong type system. Python is already strongly typed, but strong and dynamic. And really, this helps us if we want to create flexible data structures, flexible ad hoc analysis code. We can quickly build out data structures and we can even define them at runtime. In contrast, Kotlin is statically typed. So types are determined and checked at compile time. So this means a little bit more upfront work, but this also means that many type errors that might lead to runtime error in Python are found at compile time in Kotlin. And this really helps us when we work with many people on large projects. Another problem related to maintenance and scalability of projects is reproducibility of builds and reasonable management of dependencies. In Python, really, our builds and dependencies are very much influenced by our environment. This makes it very, very difficult to establish reproducible builds unless we wrap the whole environment in Docker. With Kotlin, that's a little bit more easy to, to build really stable dependency trees. Also, what Kotlin has ahead of Python, when we move outside the encapsulated C libraries in Python, Python really becomes very, very slow. Kotlin is yeah, clearly ahead in that respect. So how can I use Kotlin for machine learning? Sure, as Kotlin lover, in an ideal world, I would, of course, use Kotlin for every step in my ML project. But what does the reality look like? So building data pipelines works beautifully in Python. Experimentation, well, Python is just more flexible, and the statistic libraries are much more comprehensive. Model development, uh, sorry, Kotlin, Kotlin just isn't there. Kotlin DL is on a very good path, but 
yeah, maybe eventually we get a green check mark here, but not yet. Model surfing, this is really not a problem with Kotlin. I would say it's even faster, easier, and more elegant than with Python. So this means that I will have to build an ML system from several components, which consist of Python and Kotlin. But how can such a system actually look like? I would like to show you my personal architecture blueprint, so how I can build sustainable machine learning systems with Python and Kotlin. As I started with, machine learning and data science always includes experiments. So I want an experiment hub. And for running experiments and POCs, Python is just ideal. And in my experience, there's always a separation between the code for experiments and the components that end up in production, right? It's really very rare that actual Jupyter notebooks are deployed into production. The outcome from my experiments are model architectures and data pipelines. Um, I would build these model architectures in Python at this point because the library support is much better there. And then there are data pipelines and ETL pipelines that process my data and pass it to my model training. And I would actually choose Kotlin for that because null safety, type safety, and of course the, the integration of the infinite Java data processing universe that really make Kotlin yeah, the right choice here. And then finally, model serving. There, I would choose Kotlin, really, no question. Um, I would, or I build, actually, and train my models with Python, export them as O and X model, and then I can serve my models without any problems in Kotlin. By choosing Kotlin, I'm also free to choose how I want to interact with the rest of my business applications, because I built those in Kotlin, of course, right? What else? I can then decide if I want to integrate the model, um, the model serving directly into the application, or if I just want uh, to cover it loosely via an interface or even in a microservice architecture. This loose coupling is really currently my preferred choice. All right, and that's it. I'm done. So, really, um, what what is your experience? Are, are you using Kotlin for machine learning? Do you use Kotlin at all, or are you using 100% Python, or I don't know, are you are you using COBOL for machine learning? So yeah, feel free to drop me a line in the, in the chat or uh, speak up in, in the audience. I'm really looking forward to it. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening, for being here. You can find all the links from the sites at howgo.me 2022 Kotlin machine learning. And I think we have, do we have time for q and yeah, Probably three minutes or something like that. I'm looking forward to your question. Thanks again. Currently, there are no questions in the chat. So, anybody in the audience? Oh, uh, oh there no, are we have questions. some questions. We have some yeah, questions. I, I sorry, didn't see sorry, that is... uh, One question here, please. Hello, start with you. thank you for your talk. I found that very interesting because we do uh, deep learning with uh, Kotlin at our company as well. Nice. And uh, so my question was um, how uh, you mentioned that Kotlin DL is not quite there yet. I agree. I checked that out as well. How with the plotting library? Because uh, I found one of the great problems is on the JVM having a really good plotting library. So what would you say about the let's plot port? Is it first, is it compatible with the Python let's plot? And secondly, is it actually complete in the sense that we really get all the plots that we are used to in Python? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, if you compare one to one to let's uh, to to uh, plot, plotly, is it? I think in, in Python, it's really not one on one feature complete, right? Um, it's a good um, good alternative um, for getting for getting started, but I think in terms of really just plotting um, visualizations, um, it yeah, it's 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 not not really there uh, yet, unfortunately. Great. That's uh, what yeah. what I feared. But thank you for being so open and honest. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Anyone else want to add something? If that is not the case, no, there no, are no questions else. in the chat. Okay. So, um, question from the uh, chat: Is Kotlin a good addition to Python or Rasa? An alternative? Um, yeah. I think uh, the question came from. Uh, before the the last part of the talk, I, I will guess so. I, I think I already answered it in the last part. What about other alternatives? Rust, Go, etc. What sets Kotlin apart from other programming languages? Oh yeah, good question actually. Um, first of all, I don't have experience in Rust or Go, 
So that is one point why I like to use uh, Kotlin. Um, but I think that is not a good reason. Um, I think what sets Kotlin really apart from other uh, programming languages, uh, except for the for the nice design and the good features, um, is really Java compatibility. Because there is a lot of Java software out there, right? You you all know the 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 ugly advertising like uh, seven billion devices run Java, right? Um, so yeah, um, you have a huge ecosystem of libraries um, and um, a, yeah a mass of already running applications and you already have knowledge out there. And if you are started out as a Java developer, it's quite easy to uh, pick up to pick up Kotlin and be um, very productive with it really fast. So that is a, a plus point there. And um, as you can see, there are ways to get into machine learning with Kotlin. And I think this is a, a nice combination um, which makes it really interesting. If there are no more questions from the audience, here are more from the chat. Um, switching languages always implies learning cost. Yep, true. Um, what is the strongest argument to switch to Kotlin? Oh, the strongest argument? Mm, null safety, probably. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah. Static typing on all null safety. I think null safety is really, if you're coming from Java, then it's a really good argument, I think, because null pointer exceptions are just a pain, right? And if if you are working with Java, you are really getting used to that. And it's not nice. Um, yeah. Okay, is there something that Kotlin can do that is absolutely impossible in Python, R, or Julia? Probably not, because all are Turing complete languages. So by definition, you can do everything in each language. Um, I think, the, as I already said, Java interoperability is is nice. But you can, um, of course, run Python code on the JVM with Jiten, right? I don't know about R or Julia, um, but yeah, I would say no. There's really nothing that Kotlin can do which is absolutely impossible. Why now? None, okay. Thank you very much, Hauke, for your interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you for being here, thanks. Yes. Mm -hmm.